Hit Wicket is the cricket game backed by Harsha Bogle and me, so you know it's full of nerd energy. This strategic cricket game isn't just about frantic tapping. You make decisions based on how cricket actually works. You've got to set a batter up, right? And you can't hit a six from the first ball. Hit Wicket knows all that, and they made a game that makes it work with a few gaming twists in there as well. So play, build, and manage your team, because you are the batter, the bowler, the coach, the select. I mean, you're basically everything in this game, right? And there's no ads on Hit Wicket. So download it for free for mobile and unleash your inner cricket legend. Hello and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to episode 69 of the Footbox podcast. So shout out to all Angelo Matthews fans and some of you kinky people out there. And uh, the title... Wait, there of- might be an overlap. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. The title of this particular episode of Footmarks uh, is Pakistan's Wicketless Streak. So, I mean, the article will be out soon. Jared has also already recorded the video. All three of these items or parts of this project will be out in quick succession. This is kind of the BTS. And uh, myself, Jared and Varun, we were all working pretty hard on this one. So, let's start about, you know, talking about Pakistan's bowling, of course. We have multiple eras that we will discuss. And we'll do that all the way up to their current rut, trying to make sense of it all. And Pakistan cricket, Jared, has had two constants over, you know, their existence as a cricketing nation. And those have been wickets and sexiness. And both of those constants have now seemed to disappear. Now, Mm. taking 20 wickets in a test seems like a gargantuan task for modern day Pakistan. And that is flat out crazy if you take into account their, you know, rich uh, fast bowling and even overall bowling heritage. Yeah, I would say that. Yeah, I think it is overall, but fast bowling probably they're more hmm. known for. Yeah. But I would say that like they probably started test cricket with the greatest bowler in their first match. That, or I, hmm. Did Fuzzle play in their first match? I think he did. Didn't yes, he? he did. He unless, did. He was inju- unless he was injured. Um, uh, Fred Boffer missed Australia's first match, by the way, because <laughs> uh, the wicketkeeper hadn't been, uh, his, his friend hadn't been chosen as wicketkeeper, so he decided not to play. Didn't know it was the first test, but what a game to miss. <laughs> um yeah, so like you think about it, I know the West Indies had some good bowlers when they started, and they probably had a better rounded attack, maybe, but they didn't have the, you know, they didn't have someone off Fuzzle's uh, level. Mm. Rashid Khan would be the next best, um, and Rashid Khan really hasn't played that much Test cricket. We don't even know if mm. he is as good as we. I, I certainly thought he was going to be a very good Test player when he first started. We haven't seen that, but it's just not a normal thing to start with, you know, a, a great bowl. You start with maybe if you're lucky, you get a heat streak. Right, you know, you get yeah. that kind of bowler, and you think to yourself, "Well, that's that's good. We can build around that." But that's the best we have. And so Pakistan, from that point, uh, they didn't do what New Zealand and India and Sri Lanka and other teams had to do. Bangladesh, they didn't have to go and find a great bowler. They just started with one on day one. Mm-hmm. And we know how good Fuzzle was with his test record, but also he was supposed to play for India, right? Like if yeah, he, he would have gone on to break into an experience side as well. So that's the level he was at, and then he absolutely stars. And then from then on in we kind of think of Pakistan as a bowling nation. And you go through, yeah. you know, there's, there's a few good batters in Pakistan, but Pakistan isn't known for great batting in the way that mm. I would say India certainly is. Um, yep. I wouldn't say that Pakistan is known for great batting, even in a way that perhaps Sri Lanka has become to be mm. thought of you know, in that kind of way. And so their thing has been mostly fast bowlers and seam bowlers. And, you know, there's been a couple of fast medium wobblers around as well. Um, and the odd great spinner. And that is what they have known as. And then we get to modern day and it's like, like you know, we, we've all done this before. We're trying to work out in all format cricket if Pakistan is the fifth best Asian side at the moment. In test yep. cricket, they're the fourth best Asian side. Do you know what I mean? Like there's, yeah. there's no good kind of conversation you can have about Pakistan cricket at the moment. And so much of it is down to the fact that their bowlers don't take any wickets anymore. Yeah, I mean, these guys definitely look like imposters. And, you know, it's a nation which was known for, as you said, fast bowlers primarily, the glorious actions and, you know, the flamboyance, the flair, the hair, the pace, the hair, the pace, right? That's part of the mystery as well, right? The mystery is a big part, right? Like, what? The the I would say, obviously, the wrong one was well invented Mm. before Pakistan cricket. But I would say Abdul Qadir and Mushtaq Ahmed and and, Mm. and even uh, Shahid Afridi. Probably that that second, the finger wrong. And I think that was mm. Abdul Qadir who invented that. Then you have the Dusra with, with Saklay Mushtaq. Like, yep. 
and the reverse swing. Like they're inventing so much things. They are, you know, like the mad scientists of, of cricket mm. bowling, right? Always trying to stay one step ahead. And at the moment, you just like, well, who's their best bowler? Like, who's the bowler? Yeah. That, like, right at the moment, in the, in, if they were to play, I know they're about to play a test match, but if they're you know, about to play a test match at the moment, who's the bowler that actually gets you to turn on the TV? And I'm not Absolutely. sure they have either of those things at the moment. Yeah, I mean, taking 20 wickets in a test match is like a far fetched dream at home for Pakistan right now. But we'll come to that. Let's start with the first era. You, of course, mentioned the great Fazal Mahmood, who basically started it all. He is the pioneer or, you know, the first hero of fast bowling that Pakistan have. And I mean, this is a guy who modeled for Brill Cream, right? So he had that sex appeal as well. And in Pakistan's second ever test match, they won it because Fazal Mahmood took 12 wickets against India and Lucknow, right? And in 34 test matches that he played, spanning from 1952 to 19, 1962, which is the first era, the Fazal era, he took yep. 139 wickets uh, in 53 innings at uh, around 25 apiece. 65 of those wickets came in seven test wins at an otherworldly average of 10.69. Yep. And you mentioned how, you know, he took 2.62 wickets per innings in test cricket, which is a number bested only by seven other bowlers in history. And he did all of this with a cigarette in one hand. He was literally the definition of cool. Yeah, and he's not as well known now because a lot of this happened not on TV, right? So we have a couple of photos of him with incredible hair um, yeah. uh, with the Brill Cream ads. And we have a couple of photos with him with like a cigarette in one hand with like a cable net switcher on, which is one of the <laughs> coolest photos. There's a couple of really cool photos of old Asian cricketers that we don't have as much footage of them playing. Um, but there's a couple of photos we just oh, oh these these were legit dudes. These were <laughs> these were th this this wasn't your your uncle, right? Like this this is a <laughs> this is a real dude, this guy, right? Um and so he's clearly one of those players. And I think the wickets per innings thing, the reason I looked that up is because when Fuzzle Mamu took wickets, he just took so many bunches of them. And mm -hmm. and yeah, as you said, there's only like I think it was six or seven, I think it's six seamers who were better than him. And one of those is Sid Barnes, who is really a spinner. So there's only like five spin uh, seamers who ever took more wickets per game than him. And he doesn't take that many get wickets per match. And that's because Pakistan didn't always have to bowl twice because they weren't a very good side. And the other mm -hmm. interesting thing about him, of course, he did a lot of this on matting. And mm -hmm. on matting, he I think it was Neil Harvey who once said playing Fazal Mahmood on matting was the hardest thing that he ever had to go up against. Like it was Damn. just the ball was just zipping around everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and not all, you know, generally matting in in the few situations we have in test cricket, matting usually helps the spinners more because you get mm -hmm. consistent spin and, and the, you know, um, it spins from day one and everything else. Like the four, four leg spinners of the apocalypse from South Africa. Exactly. That was a big part of theirs. So Fazal Mamou, be, you know, being a good bowler on Manning with a four piece ball is actually hmm. like quite the skill to have. Uh, look, he's a fascinating cricketer, but certainly it's where it starts, right? Yeah, yeah. He is the one who kicks that supply chain of fast bowlers off in many ways. And, uh, you know, one thing to note over here is that despite Fuzzle's heroics, in those 10 years, this decade, uh, which is our first era, only India and New Zealand had a worse seam bowling average than Pakistan. And Pakistan spinners were only better than New Zealand. They were averaging 44.34 runs per dismissal. The strike rates were also middling for both seamers and spinners. So basically, in this era, it was fuzzle or bust. Yeah, and and look, if you if you have to average ten runs per wicket in wins, I think that tells you how much work <laughs> you're having to do for your team. Yeah. Um, it, so the rest of the attack was what you would expect. It was people mm. coming to Test cricket for the first time. You know, uh, there's remember it's kind of two teams split up in some ways, isn't it? Because it was all one team um, in India, and suddenly it's a team in Pakistan and it's a team yep. in India. And India wasn't particularly strong. So you're not imagining that suddenly Pakistan's coming in with a great side. Um, and, and so I, I think that makes sense. It's, uh, you know, when, when you look at it from that perspective. Yeah, I mean, he was definitely one of those, you know, cricketers who people wanted to idolize back in the day. Uh, I knew someone whose uncle's uncle was Fazal Mahmood and that family still spoke about him, right? And people still met them that, oh, your uncle's uncle was Fazal Mahmood. And that was a thing. Uh, yeah. But anyway... Moving on is that to our real, next era. Is that real uncle or is that... <laughs> oh, this is, this is Pakistan. Right? You, uncles, yeah, where everyone's have, an uncle. 
I have no idea. Maybe they just forced him to be their uncle's uncle, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's already a stretch, his uncle's yeah. uncle. But anyway, uh, let's talk about the next era now. In the 14 years after Fuzzle's last test match, which was in August 1962, Pakistan's fast bowling average went up four runs. 233. And weirdly enough, they had the second best spin bowling average in this phase. I, I reckon Intikhab Alam might have had a role to play yeah, in that. Uh, but their overall bowling average, you know, in this period was better only than India and New Zealand. And Pakistan's results reflected this, right? They won just three out of 34 mm -hmm. test matches that they played in this period. And their win-loss ratio, again, was only better than New Zealand. All three of those victories also came against the Kiwis. So these are basically what we call the barrier years and you could make an argument that they might have been more shit than they are right now back then yeah i mean I, they were as a team i just there was i think it's worth remembering that fuzzle probably carries them a little bit early on and yeah. because he wins test matches he makes their record look a little bit better and so they got accepted to test cricket quite quickly mm. and then they went back to what bangladesh becomes and you know and and, yeah. and what you know new zealand was new zealand but Pakistan, and I'd throw in India, although I think India had some very good cricketers, but maybe not very good teams at times. Hmm. I think all three of those teams, up until about 1975, really struggled, right? Yeah. They really struggled to be consistently good. And you've got, on the other hand, obviously South Africa's gone by the 70s, but South Africa after World War II become a very good team. Australia and England both had great runs in that period. And the West Indies have got an incredible mm. side. So they really what it's funny now people go, I don't know why Bangladesh is still playing. And it's just like the gap <laughs> between the best teams and the worst teams in that era was far uh, you know, more varied than it is now. The difference is yeah. now we don't have draws. So you can't, you can't get yeah. a sneaky draw uh, like the way they used to. So I'm not surprised they didn't take any wickets at that point. I just don't think they were a, a very strong team overall. Yeah, I mean, that is actually a very fascinating point that you brought up, the draws one. Because if you actually look at those 34 test matches, I don't know what the numbers are on the top of my head, but they did draw a lot, right? Yep. This current team is losing a lot more. So that's something that maybe you guys, you know, have, have to ponder no, on. There would be no doubt in my mind that that team was is a better team. Uh, sorry, is a worse team than this current one. And I'm not, yeah. not saying... You know, we're doing a time traveling thing there. I'm saying mm. in their era, they were a much yeah. worse team than this mm. team is in its era because you're really talking about developing as a nation and learning what you are as a cricket nation and everything at that point. And yeah. the draws quite often make some of those old teams look slightly better than they were. But True. when you look for the wins, there's no wins. Like, who did yeah. they beat? New Zealand three times, and New Zealand mm. were a shit version of Bangladesh for a lot of that yeah. time, right? Like New, New Zealand would have been a better team, but most of their best players were playing in England, so they couldn't even keep their best players around. So yeah. really, until about the mid-70s, New Zealand isn't a factor at all. So if that's the only team you're beating, that's like now if you were to say, oh, this team, this team can only be Bangladesh from the early 2000s, that's kind of what you're saying of Pakistan. Yeah, and I'm sure if we bring that team to the modern era in a time machine, like none of them would probably make it to the 11. Maybe Intikhab. Maybe he would make it to the 11 because Pakistan don't really have a spinner. I think yeah. he might, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, you know, the eras are different and this team is losing a lot more because we get more results now. But anyway, that is a separate podcast. Coming back to the, you know, premise and we'll go to the next era because things changed for Pakistan October 97, 1976 onwards. Uh, they basically remained really, really good until the end of the millennium. So this is Pakistan's golden era. Safaraz Nawaz, the man with the burly moustache who was iconic in Australia after his nine for in Melbourne. He made reverse swing mainstream for Pakistan and then he taught it to a young Imran Khan who basically personified Pakistan cricket as long as he was playing for the team, right? He was the man. And then he transferred his knowledge uh, onto the two Ws, Wasim and Wakar, who are, you know, Pakistan's two most prolific uh, bowlers in test cricket. And they destroyed stumps for fun with their reverse swinging, toe crushing Yorkers. And this is a 23 year period, right? 23 odd years. Pakistan seamers were only behind the West Indies and South Africa in terms of average. And, and South Africa South don't play the whole time either. Exactly. South Africa yeah. didn't even play the entire decade of the 90s. So that's, you know, mm. worth remembering. And also, Pakistan did this on largely or, or mostly flat decks at home. So yep. that is quite insane when you think about it. This period is what kind of defines Pakistan cricket in many ways. Yeah, because I think there's two things that happen here. A, they get good, right? So mm. they become more interesting because they're good. Uh, you know, would Imran Khan have been the cricketer he was if Pakistan had been better and they hadn't have kept him around for 10 years 
do you know what I mean? Developing and, mm. and, and everything else. Like he got a very good work experience and then he became probably the best player in the 1980s. I, I, I think probably yeah. by distance. Right. Um, so, you know, you've got, you've got an element there of, um, uh, you know, this long era, you know, all these sort of things coming together in the 1980s. We know they're the second best side in the 1990s, probably South Africa are pretty good as well. So, you know, but they're, again, they're in that, in that upper echelon and it's also when they're on tv they win a world cup mm. you know all these things start to happen the hair um, the hair the, becomes more pronounced in this period <laughs> there's a lot of hair and you know we talked about we talked about the other day that you know one of the few teams that we would want to take to india um to mm. play current day india is one of those late 90s pakistan teams right yep like and we also talked about one of their teams from the 80s so we, we literally talked for two teams from this era that we thought could potentially go over there. And it tells you just how good they were at that point. You've given everyone two spoilers because that foot marks is after this one. So, is it? And, <laughs> yeah. and everything I just said was a lie. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, you have the video on the main channel anyway. Uh, but you cannot underscore uh, the fact that this was the golden period of Pakistan bowling because their spinners had also, you know, done really well. They had a combined average of 32 runs per wicket in these Which 23 odd sound years. Good. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't sound good, but you know, it was the best amongst all okay. teams combined. Abdul Qadir was the best tweaker of his generation. He, you know, kept leg spin alive, right? Mm -hmm. And Saklen Mushtaq, he pioneered the Dusra. Uh, Mushtaq Ahmed was around as well. So it's not surprising that Pakistan were the best spin bowling team for 23 odd years. I'd go further too. I'd say they probably missed the peak of Mushtaq Ahmed because they decided to not pick him anymore when he probably got better. Uh, yeah. when he was quite old. Like when he was at Sussex was probably when he was at his best. Mm. He was in complete control of what he was doing by that point. Um, you know, I'm a bit biased because I'm a huge fan, but I never th I never thought we saw even the best of him at Test Cricket. But yeah, mm. you're right. I mean, Abdul Qadir, what was his bowling average? About 32, 33 in Test Cricket? Yeah, something like yeah. that. But there's no other spinner in that era who kind of matches that. that I, it's not that they don't match it. It's that they're nowhere near that record of, of, yeah. of him. It's like, literally, I think the rest of the spinners combined average like 57 or something ridiculous <laughs> in that era. Like, I, I could be making that number up, but I remember sending it to Usman the other day because uh, we were having a chat about something. And I was like, you won't believe this, but like, <laughs> you know, and I'm, I will end up doing a video on, on Abdul Qadir just for that alone. Yeah. Anyway, uh, in, um, interestingly it, enough, though Abdul Qadir's son Usman Qadir has retired from Pakistan cricket, and I've been I've been told he's going to South Africa now after his stint in Australia. If you I was remember. about to say, was he Australian? Yeah, no, now it's South Africa next, and I, I believe it's that relationship with Imran Tahir that he's probably leveraging. Well, anyway, again, major his, tangent. Well, <laughs> yeah, his I mean, his father he just was a great bowler. Sakhalin yeah. Mushtaq was a great bowler until he got obsessed with the Dusra, and I think he mm -hmm. limited his own use. And Mushtaq Ahmed was a really, really good bowler. Wasn't particularly good in Asia, but was probably one of the best spinners outside of Asia, and I think probably would have been great later on in his career, as I said before. And, and they had, um, uh, what was his name? Um, Iqbal? Iqbal Qasim. I Iqbal Qasim. Iqbal Qasim and Tosif Ahmed were the heroes of the Bangalore 80s. win, or the Bengaluru the test win back in 87. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, the bowling was and stacked. And we're talking about all that, and we haven't talked about, um, you know, Shoaib Akhtar, right? Yes. We have bowling all-rounders, you know, Abdul Razak and um, mm. Azmoud. Yeah, yeah, so many players. I mean, if you think about it, you know, Sarfaraz, Imran, Wasim Wakar, Shoaib, Azad Mahmood, Razak, Saklan, Mushtaq Ahmed, and then you've also got Abdul Qadir. This is like the era for Pakistan bowling and for Pakistan overall. And, you know, I was gonna the say, numbers for Pakistan kind of... cricket, really, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. It is for Pakistan cricket. And, you know, the numbers check out as well. Their overall bowling average uh, was also third best in the world from October 1976 till the end of 1999, which is a sizable amount of years, right? Uh, it is a bit of a dynasty. It's only that they didn't really win that much. But if you talk about eras, this is the one you need to look at if you want to, like, you know, hype up Pakistan cricket. But then, Jared comes the 2000s pre-exile era for Pakistan, which starts, yep. of course, at the start of the millennium. And then it goes right up until the Sri Lankan uh, team attack in Lahore in March So it's about nine years, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. March 2009. So about eight years and change, right? Or oh, nine years and change, sorry. Yep. Um, yeah, so Wasim and Bakar, they retired early on in the 2000s. Saklan, as you mentioned, disappeared into a Dusra vortex. And we never really saw him again after that test match versus India, I think. Uh, in which Sevag just took him to the cleaners. And then you had bowlers like Shoaib Akhtar and Mohammad Asif around who managed to keep the spice of Pakistan's bowling alive. Yeah. But they were often injured or banned. And, you know, Pakistan's bowling average in this period was only better than the West Indies, Zimbabwe. 
Oh, sorry, yeah, West Indies, Zimbabwe, and Bangladesh. Bangladesh, right? yes. But Those were the only teams which were not as good as Pakistan in this period. Is that not also the Danish Canaria era? Yeah, yeah, Danish Canaria was in that era as well. And, and you know, he was decent I mean, for a bit. What bowling average, do you think? 38? He used to go for a lot of runs. He was a wicket taker, but he would go for plenty. Yeah, he I mean... He does have 260-odd wickets, though, in Test Cricket. He has how many? 260-odd. Wow, that is a yeah. lot more wickets than I thought. You're right, he took a lot of wickets. Yeah, he went at about 35 and at over three mm. runs and over, but with 15 five-wicket holes. Um, so when yeah. he took them, he took them. So, I mean, you've got three... I, I mean, I don't think he was a great bowler, but he's like, he was fine and you had to play him, you know. Uh, maybe his greatest moment in Test cricket was sledging Brian Lara. Yeah. Uh, which is me almost an entire chapter in my book. Those, those which was... Dead-ish. It was also in this era, by the way. It was 2007 or six, late 2006, maybe. If you, if, if after you've watched this podcast, go and Google <laughs> that uh, Dedish Canera Brad Lara. It is worth watching it. Anyway, yeah. um, so I think, um, uh, it, it, I think that there's no doubt that they had a couple of guys who could bowl mm-hmm. in that era. But my memory of it was that wa- it was very thin. It yes. was a couple of guys, and if they weren't available, if Shaw wasn't there, um, and Muhammad Asif wasn't wasn't always available, that it was like. Dennis Canera was on his own at times, mm. um, and and they did struggle in that period. Uh, they had very good batting in that period, though. Yes. NZ, Moyo, and Eunice were playing in tandem yeah, for the most part of that period. But, you know, uh, I remember some test wins from that era, and Pakistan beat England at home. But again, it was Shwe Bakhtar who went crazy, right? Mohammad Asif, whenever he played Pakistan, you know, won a lot when he was around, right? And as you mentioned, Danish Canaria was the frontline leg spinner. But then again, if you've got a bowling average only better than West Indies, Zimbabwe, and Bangladesh, uh, not to mention the flat tracks at home, right? They were dead as fuck. Uh, That definitely played a role. But this is not a glorious era of Pakistan test cricket bowling. Not at all. Um, However, from that point on, oh well, after the Sri Lankan attacks uh, in March 2009, Pakistan don't return home till the end of 2019. And uh, weirdly enough, they experienced another good run in this period when they played almost all of their home cricket in the UAE. I know there were a few tests in England, there was Australia once, but it's more so the UAE era. And Ms. Was, Bahad, was it only, was it only two? Uh, they played Australia in two tests. I covered those, actually. I um, think that's it. Did, I, they, there was always talk that they were going to play in Sri Lanka, but they never did, did they? No. It was just UAE. That is early 2000s when they played some test matches in Sri yeah. Lanka. That was also was, against Australia. Was when, they, when they came to England, so they were trying to make it work mm. in England, but England yes. didn't quite work just because it, it, the England grounds are hard to get because of counter cricket, right? And well, the spot fixing scandal also happened, so that didn't yeah, happen. Yeah, I, I don't think that, I think they were having issues beforehand. And. Mm. And also, they didn't get the crowds that they expected in those games. And then, um, and then I remember them talking about Sri Lanka, but I, I was pretty sure they never actually went and played there in the end. But yeah, the UAE. So the interesting thing about the UAE is like, you know, when someone like me is doing records, hmm. it's like you count it as neutral because it wasn't really neutral. They were home conditions for Pakistan um, yeah. in the way that they played there, and they ha- they were better in the UAE than they had been at home in the previous yep. decade. It is true. And, you know, Ms. Buzz's team, after, you know, these shrunken attacks and the spot-fixing candle, uh, candle, wow, the spot-fixing scandal, although I would love to see a spot-fixing candle, you know, how, how does wax kind of, you know, corrupt Please cricket? Tell these. Is this a business <laughs> opportunity? <laughs> Maybe. But Ms. Buzz took that team, you know, uh, which was full of controversy, and then he kind of steadied the ship in a way that yeah. has never been steadied in Pakistan cricket prior. And, you know, Pakistan for that, you know, millisecond or three minutes, whatever, were number one uh, in test cricket. Uh, and that was phenomenal. It, it spoke of Pakistan's resilience. And it was on mm. the back of Saeed Ajmal and Yasir Shah, more so. Uh, unfortunately, their careers never overlapped, but it didn't really matter because their in their own... overlap, didn't they? They just weren't picked at the same time. I mean, yes, Yasser wasn't picked when Saeed was around, yeah. but then Saeed's I mean, bowling actually I mean, got called out. You're right. Their test careers didn't overlap, but what I mean is, like, it was it was one of those situations where they could have, if they yeah. had wanted to, to, to I pick. Mean, a, a bit like Harath and Murali. Like, we always say the careers didn't overlap, and it's like, well, they did. It's just, you didn't pick him. Well, those ones, those careers did overlap, though. I've seen Harath and Murali in the same playing 11. There has never been a test match in which Saeed Ajmal and Yasser Shah yeah. played. 
Oh yeah, yeah no, so that, no. Harath played early different. and then didn't play for a decade yeah. and then came back. But yeah. but you know what I mean? Like we, we kind of pretend like they didn't play together. Where you have to be a little bit more honest with that. Um, Abdul Rahman mm. is also someone we don't yes. talk about enough. A fast um, spinner, uh, wrecked England, right in the UAE. Bowling uh, so average of twenty nine in Test cricket, like a, you know, the, which is pretty. There good. aren't that many spinners who have bowling averages under thirty in the history of the game. I know he didn't take a hundred wickets, so it's not mm. not a full sample. But he was fantastic in those conditions. He was a brilliant second spinner and, you know, he was also a great foil to Saeed Ajmal. And they were turning the ball, you know, in different directions, even though Saeed Ajmal was turning the ball in every direction, disproving science still this day. Uh, but, you know... Um, also, they he, had that was the left-arm pace era, wasn't it? Like, they had... Yes. I remember... Amir Wahab, in, Junaid, all of those guys. Rahad Ali. Rahad Ali, Rahad Ali, Ali as well. Meant to start with, uh, um, the, the GOAT. <laughs> but yeah. I remember being asked by... But, Pakistan fan, fans going, uh, have we got is, is too many left armers in this attack? And I was like, what are you guys talking about? Like, we've had literally hundreds of years with all right arm bowling attacks yep. and no one's ever blinked an eye. Why would left armers be a problem? They're only a problem if if you think that Rahad Ali is going to save you and he's probably not. Yeah. I mean, you know, they had a wealth of left-handers at their disposal at the time. I know Amir uh, was got not playing test cricket for half of this decade. Uh, but still, you know, once he came back, he played in tandem with Wahab and Rahat. And I never thought that too many left-handers in, in the lineup is an issue. But, you know, coming back to Ajmal and Yasir, they might not have overlapped, but their careers, however long they were, uh, they were demonic in nature in many ways that they were leading the attack and they were taking all the wickets. Mm. So much so that only India's spinners averaged better in these 10 years, right? 2019 yeah. to 20... Uh, sorry, to 2009 to 2019. And, you know, the fast bowlers... Didn't have great returns, but Pakistan still had the best, or fifth best, sorry, overall bowling average in the world in this period. And 20 wickets in a test match was not an issue when Ajmal and Yasser, or even Muhammad Abbas was around, you know, mm. for that brief period. So, I'd say that this was also a successful period, perhaps the most successful period after that 23-year period from October 76 to the end of the millennium. They got to number one. I mean, I think that's yeah. the most important thing there, isn't it? They got to number one in the world. They put themselves in a really good position, um, uh, you know, and, and they played some really, really good cricket. And it, it, it was a weird one because it was on the back of their spinners. And it's yeah. one thing, we, you know, when we talk about Asian cricket, Pakistan pitchers get lumped in as Asian. And of course they are Asian, hmm. but they're not spinning Asian. They're yep. flat Asian, which is a mm -hmm. completely different beast. UAE was a spinning wicket, right? And Syed yeah. Ajmal and Rahman and um, and Yasser Shah had success because suddenly the wickets were in their favor, which is you're not also, always the case in Pakistan. You're also forgetting Zulfikar Babur, the man yeah. who looked yeah, like he was got... 50, but he also was a decent second spinner. Well, Canaria, and right now, did Canaria bowl at all in the UAE in that period as well? No, no. Canaria he didn't. was, he was caught for spot fixing, remember? In, in the I thought he championship. was caught in about 2011. Was it before then? Okay. Yes, yes, it was. I mean, the last I remember of Canaria in a Pakistan shirt was in 2010 in England, I believe. Uh, maybe there's a series or two after that, but that's the last I remember of him. Uh, but anyway... Uh, let's go to the next era when Test Cricket finally returns to Pakistan in December 2019. Now, they host Sri Lanka, Bangladesh and South Africa at home first up uh, across like two years or one and a half years or something. And they won each of those series. Now, they of course lost to New Zealand and England away from home. But mm. bowling sides out in their own backyard in Test Cricket was not an issue in this small little period, right? The bowling averages weren't particularly flattering. But upon return to home soil... Pakistan were winning up until Australia tour in March 2022. Yeah, it, I think that's one of the more interesting things, isn't it? And I know there's a, you know, we haven't really talked much about Ramiz Raja, um, hmm. he, you know, uh, he, he, but there is definitely a decision that is made to make the pitches even more flat. I think they were pretty yep. flat when they came back. Because mm -hmm. remember, when Pakistan come back to Test Cricket, it's 2019, right? Yes. Global averages have dropped everywhere. Pakistan, mm -hmm. even on... Result wickets still has a much higher average. So the wickets were still flatter than everywhere else. I, I think yes. I said in the piece that they were, uh, it's like they brought their pickets, uh, their wickets from uh, the mid uh, 2000s, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And I mean, yep. you know, reverse swing was key in this era as well. Plus they were yep. playing, well, Sri Lanka and Bangladesh were weaker sides at this point uh, compared to Pakistan. South Africa was the big series win. And I remember like Hassan Ali was brilliant in that series. Yeah. Shaheen was brilliant as well. And the paces, uh, seam bowling was what won Pakistan that series. It was, it was. But those wickets were a little bit more friendly, I thought, yes. than all the others. Those were amazing wickets. If I could choose any, 
you know, sort of wicket for all Pakistan home tests forever, those would be the ones because 300 was a good score and that's what you want to see. Uh, but anyway, let's come to the winless streak then. The start of the Australian series in March 2022 is where it starts. Uh, that series saw two drawn games and then Pakistan lost the decider. Then they got swept by England 3-0 end of that year, which was the first time Pakistan ever got swept in a home test series in history. They drew nil-nil versus New Zealand shortly after, in which they could have very easily lost a test match, or both even. And then most recently, they got swept 2-0 versus Bangladesh and Rawalpindi, uh, a team basically which they had never lost to, home or away. The main theme over here is that in these, these 10 test matches, Jared, Pakistan took 128 wickets and only, you know, took 20 wickets in a test on one occasion. And that's goddamn scary. It's an incredible stat, really. <laughs> and yes, so let's go back to the Ramiz Raja part of it. We know that there was, they wanted the test matches to go as long as possible. Hmm. They didn't want three-day test matches. They wanted to make sure that they're on air for as long as possible. I think part of the reason is that Pakistan cricket had missed the whole thing that actually four-day test matches work much better because they move quicker and they're more exciting. <laughs> and then if you have to have the fifth day, you have it. There was a, because it used to be a big thing in England. England used to have five day test matches as well. You, you know, I used to call it CEO Brown. All the county um, uh, cha chairman and, and um, CEOs would come in and go, Oh, imagine if we don't get a fifth day here, we'll miss out on all this extra money. And then they started realizing hey, that's not how it works. And if the test is really boring, no one wants to come for a fifth day. Yeah. And it's like Pakistan came back and Rambo got a little bit confused. And then the groundsman put out some of the most flat wickets of all time. Yep. So we, we understand that. They then ran into baseball, right? Mm -hmm. Which is even also when the fair. wickets were slightly better, baseball was just too good for them. It it just it punched them in the face, you know, yep. and they never recovered from that, right? They <laughs> never really recovered from the first moment of it. Yeah. Um, New Zealand was a pretty poor side, and yeah. re realistically, they should have forced a result at one stage mm -hmm. in that series. But I think the most interesting one is that they juiced the wickets up for Bangladesh. Mm. And their batters couldn't handle them. And the Bangladesh batters smashed their bowlers everywhere, right? Like, yeah. it was, it really was a pretty poor effort from them in that series. Mm -hmm. So it, it's not as if everything was, uh, you know, yes, Australia and England had about four test matches that were very flat. And there was at least one very flat one in New Zealand. But it, they weren't all exactly the same wickets. It's yeah. been a couple of different wickets. And even at time, when they tried to make it a friendly wicket for bowlers, it was a friendly wicket for the opposition bowlers and not for theirs. If you make any content, Minbo Pro is the tool for you. Take your long format content and cut it and slice it for social media. This AI inspired weapon will turn your one piece of work into so many clips. Try Minbo.pro now. Absolutely. And, and we'll get like right into the depths of that. But, you know, a lot of people bring up the pitches often when they're trying to, you know, kind of narrow down uh, the main reason behind Pakistan's wicked drought uh, at home. And while this might be a reason, Pakistan a, has always had flat pitches, right? Mm -hmm. And then you can also factor in that, you know, in these 10 winless, winless home tests, they, or well, the local bowlers have averaged 47 with the ball in comparison to opposition bowlers who have averaged 36, which is 11 runs better per wicket. That tells you that the main pain point is not placid surfaces. And also, if that sounds massive, think about 10 wickets per innings. Hmm. So they, their bowlers are more than 100 runs worse yeah. than the opposition's bowlers per innings. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's... When I saw that, I, you know, I, you know, you and um, Varun found that. I was just like, "That's incredible to me." Yeah. And so you can't, at that stage, blame the pitches. If the opposition are taking wickets at thirty-six, we know that they're flat pitches, hmm. but they're taking wickets, and your bowlers aren't taking wickets. You can't just point to the wickets at that point. No, no, absolutely not. And it's also worth mentioning that in these ten tests, opposition seamers average thirty-one with the ball, which is not bad at all. If you're blaming really pitches. 31 by opposition seamers is great. Pakistan seamers, on the other hand, were averaging 47. It's a similar story for spinners, right? Overseas spinners Stop were averaging... It. 47. Yeah. 47. <laughs> That's what Paul Collingwood should average on these wickets. Sorry, 47 continue. basically means 470 runs in an innings. 
right? If really? seamers are only, if it's just seamers yeah. bowling. But even if when you look at overseas spinners, right, they're averaging 40 with the ball. Sure, Pakistan doesn't have spinning wickets, but Pakistan's spinners are averaging 46. So, yeah. you know, we can make a case that Pakistan's away numbers are still good in this period. Like this, seamers are averaging 30.28. The spinners are averaging just under 34. And that amounts to an overall bowling average of 31.72 since the start of 2022. You know, uh, amongst teams, of course, which have played a minimum of five test matches in this period. Uh, and that's second best in the world, by the way. So it's not an away bowling issue. It is more so a home bowling issue for Pakistan. And their bowlers have just forgotten how to take wickets at home. And it is so baffling. It's the, that's the fascinating thing for me. Of It's the combination of those two things that you put mm -hmm. together. Where you just go. So I think what, when we come away from this, we'll say it can't be the pitchers. Because the opposition bowlers are bowling really well on the, on the Pakistan pitchers. But then you're like, but the minute Pakistan gets away from home, their bowling is fine. Right? Yeah. Better than fine, but fine, let's say. I right? mean, look, if and you so think you about it, uh, sorry to interject, but they've won tests away from home in Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, and the West Indies, I think Zimbabwe as well, but that was before Not the greatest teams is what I yeah. would say. I think but, if we're putting a caveat on that, we would have yeah. to say that it's, it's a good average, but against hmm. some poor batting lineups. That's fair. But you know, since the start of 2022, they've won test matches. It's just that they've been away, right? Yes. And, uh, you know, amongst teams which have played at least five test matches in this period, Pakistan's pace bowling average at home is 38 runs per wicket, right? Uh, mm. Which is the worst in the world. And their spin bowling average is 41 in this period as well, which is only better than Ireland. So overall, Pakistan have the second worst bowling average amongst all teams in these two and a half years, which is a stupendous 39.46 runs per dismissal. And Jared, this is an era in which batters aren't even scoring many runs. You know, that even paints a more terrible picture over here. Yeah, and also... What, to get back to what we said before, this is a bowling team, right? Mm. This is where, pa pa the reason we know about Pakistan, the reason that they're, you know, such a well-loved and well-remembered team is for bowling. And mm. that is just next level shit on in any way you look at it. And you think about it, right? Home tests average was what? Base bowlers were at 70, uh, 47. And then when you factor in away test, it's still at 38. Spin bowlers were what, at 46. When you factor in away test, it's still at 41. So even if they've been decent versus poorer or not as strong teams away from home, the home test numbers are so bad that they inflate the overall number to a point where they are absolute shit and the worst in the world. That is the main takeaway over here. And Jared, if you look at this historically, right? Let's look at all the eras that we've discussed thus far. You know, the Fuzzle era, uh, was a good one for Pakistan at home because only Australia and the West Indies outbowled Pakistan, right? In Pakistan. And even in the barren years, you know, where 14 years Pakistan win three test matches, New Zealand are the only team that have bettered Pakistan with the ball. And when you look at the golden era, right? October 76 to the end of the millennium, only West Indian seamers bested Pakistan in Pakistan. So they were that good at home. And I'll take this one step further. We spoke about how the 2000s pre-exile era was not a great one for Pakistan, right? South Africa were the only team mm. with a better bowling average than the home side in this period. And no team outbowled Pakistan in the UAE. And all of this just goes on to show you how grave the situation really is currently. Yeah, I think that's the interesting thing for me is, you know, I, I have always thought that Pakistan are great bowlers because of bad pitches. Mm. And I think that I would lump Australia and West Indies in with this as well. That if your if your pitches are naturally flat or hard to get wickets on, right? So yeah. West Indies wickets aren't particularly good batting wickets, but they're not always particularly good wickets to get anyone out on, right? Hmm. And Australia, uh, outside of the new ball, are very very flat wickets, right? Yeah. Um, outside, Australia and India probably have the two flattest wickets traditionally, I, I, I would say, in cricket. And then and then. Pakistan, oh, and, and I'll probably put Pakistan up there as well, but Pakistan have these other wickets where, again, it's just very, very hard to dismiss anyone. And so you look at the history of their cricket, and we talked about it before, the finger wrong and, you know, a yeah. reverse swing, the dusra. All these things come out of having to find a way to get wickets. And mm. it's like all of the modern bowlers don't have any way of getting, out, of getting anyone out on a flat pitch anymore. And... If that was, if, if we go back to what we were talking about before and the other bowling lineups were having just as much trouble, you'd be like, maybe these are just epically flat wickets and we have yeah. to do that. But if the other teams are working it out. That, hmm. that is a problem with your team. And it's worse if your team's still taking wickets away from home. So yeah. 
it's so confusing to me, that entire conversation, really. It, it really is bizarre when you think about it, because I think it really needs to be highlighted that the decks in Pakistan have mostly always been flat. And yeah. as you mentioned, it was the utility of reverse swing and making that mainstream, you know, uh, because all the bowlers really needed it in the domestic circuit. Without reverse swing, they would just get butchered. And then, you know, yeah. you're un unearthing these amazing spinners who are keeping leg spin alive and discovering the dusra and, you know, mm. kind of teaching it to others. That is why Pakistan were a phenomenal bowling side at home, even in the eras where they struggled. That's the main theme here, right? That's what we're kind of trying to get at. And I mean, you just, you're just left scratching your head of how, you know, in this current uh, demise or decline, whatever, it's not yet a demise, they're still alive, but it is a decline. <laughs> Opposition bowlers are doing better and you can't really pin this on the surfaces at all. And, and, and let's move on to Pakistan's bowlers now because I think this is important, right? Shaheen Shah Afridi definitely needs to be discussed over here because yep. he has not been the same bowler ever since he injured his knee in a test match in Sri Lanka in July 2022. Up until then, Jared, he had 99 wickets in 25 test matches at less than 25 apiece. But since mm. then, uh, he has only played five test matches for starters and he's averaged, averaged 41 with the ball, which simply is not acceptable for a leader of any attack. Not even Bangladesh's or Zimbabwe's or take any other nation. Their attack won't accept that either. And this is it's a guy... Not, yeah, I, it's funny you keep saying not acceptable for a leader of attack. It's not acceptable for your fifth bowler. Yeah. If you're averaging over 40, right? That's true. Yeah. That's absolutely like, true. Like, it's just, you know, over 40, if it's a part-timer, that's fine. But if, if, they're a, if they're in the side too bold, they should be averaging under 40. And this is yeah. a guy who was on the path to greatness. And yeah, I we mean... Know yeah, sorry, guy. Yeah, 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 go finish your thought. No, I was just going to say, we know what happened. Essentially, he got injured. They rushed him back because there was a World Cup. Mm -hmm. He got injured again in that World Cup. And since then, I, I, he's slow. He doesn't seem to swing the ball as much. He doesn't look as athletic. Um, you watch him bowl. I, I think I said in the video, he looks like a Shaheen Afridi impersonator. Right? Yeah. He looks like someone with the action and the hairstyle without any of the source. Not like, I cannot deny any of that. And you know, I was in the press box uh, in the most recent test match he played where he went 27.5 overs wicketless versus Bangladesh and Rahul Pindi. And he had to basically wait up until the third new ball to strike. And this, again, to your point, is a guy who built a reputation for himself as a new ball destroyer. You know, he used to average under 20 with the ball in the first 10 overs before he injured his knee. And, you know... That was basically Shaheen's USP. Ooh, first yeah. over wickets. Yeah, he's going to strike with the new ball. He's going to absolutely wreck you up front. He's he was, not been doing that. I think he was the best new ball bowler in the world during his peak and not by a little bit. Probably mm. all formats. Yeah. Right? And, that's... You know, and, and he's gone from that to someone who looks like you'd use him in a county game at second mm. change. Like Absolutely. it really, how far, maybe in counter game, second change, but first division county, second change, probably opening the bowling in second division. But, you know, he just doesn't look like anyone with any zip or hmm. energy or anything when you watch him bowl. It's really disappointing. Yeah, I mean, as you mentioned, the speeds have been down considerably. There have been times where I've seen Shaheen clocking it like in the 120s, right? Kilometers per hour, which is... I mean, that's a medium pacer, really. The lateral movement is gone. He used to pitch it up first and batters didn't know what to do. They were LBW candidates and he would hit the stumps. And now you see them driving the ball with ease. That's where we're at right now, right? And I mean, I spoke to Azam Mahmood in a press conference who said that it might be, or he thinks that it's the way the ball is coming out of Shaheen's wrist. Uh, a lot of people say it's the front leg. You and I firmly believe that it's the rehab process that went wrong. They yeah. rushed him back after injury. He could never really properly recover. And, you know... Uh, this is a guy who used to demolish top orders and these days he can't even clean up a tail. But, Jared, there is an interesting thing over here. Shaheen has only played four out of these 10 winless home tests for Pakistan and three of those actually came pre-injury versus yeah. Australia. So he's actually not the root cause of Pakistan's bowling woes over here, which was probably the most fascinating discovery for me when I was writing this piece. Well, I just thought he hadn't played that much. I wasn't massively hmm. surprised. I, look... He's an issue because he's such a weapon and he can change games. And, you know, he only played in four of the 10 test matches. Is that what you, yeah. is that what we just said? Well, that yep. is part of the root cause though, isn't it? Because if he mm. played in the other six um, and was fit, 
then yeah. then they probably don't lose 10 test matches they don't no, they, they but, didn't lose 10 test matches they just didn't win test, test well matches. it felt like they lost all 10 of them um, they lost uh, 6 out of 10 which is still quite bad <laughs> they got they'd never been swept at home and they got swept at home yeah. twice so, they are Jared they are at a home ground disadvantage as we speak <laughs> 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 that's um, where we're at. Their home is not safe. Yeah. Um, so look, oh, I that's think, funny and dark, Jared. It's, it's very dark. dark very yeah. Dark. <laughs> um, but but yeah. So you know, you look at them as as a team, and uh, and you, and you look at that, and then you go to the fast bowlers, and you're like, Nazim's always injured. So the mm. two best bowlers are injured. That I, that has to play a part, right? And Nazim yeah. hasn't been brilliant in in Test matches. Um, so you know, so far, um, he's been good. You know, he's. We know what he can do, but mm. it's a bit like Jofra Archer when you look at it and you go, well, "His overall record isn't as good as it should be," but he just hasn't yeah. had a run where he can play enough tests. And then there's six other seamers that they've tried, and of those six other seamers, one of the one of which had bowled in Test cricket before that period, they've just gone through everyone with no experience, with no continuity mm-hmm. on on pitches that are not set up for seam bowlers to be successful. I know the oppositions have done a well, but not set up for seam bowlers to be successful. And you're like, it's just, it's madness. This whole idea that they're going to find this mystery seamer who's going to come in and be, <laughs> you know, the savior. And it, it's classic Pakistan cricket of, we'll yes. find a, a a young person who will come in and he will take 38 wickets. And you're like, hey, guys, if you had a look at Muhammad Abbas in Hampshire, like you guys decided years ago that he wasn't any good. And literally he has averaged 21 in first class cricket since you got rid of him. Like yeah. maybe you went a little bit too soon on the Muhammad Abbas just um, de- uh, deciding he'd lost a, pu- a yard. Yeah, and I mean, you know, you talk about the savior complex or messiah complex. This is a thing in Pakistan that extends beyond cricket, right? There are no <laughs> systems in place. You're always looking for that savior or hero who can come and fix everything. And even the people who kind of come into those roles view themselves as that. Rambo is a good example of this, right? Like he thought that he could fix everything and do everything himself. But what you really need to do is put some structure in place and have that system which works as a well-oiled machine so that there is continuity. But just to kind of shed more light to what you just said over here, let's take a look at all the paces that Pakistan have used during this uh, streak or winless streak of 10 home test matches. Uh, There have been six in total if you discount Shaheen and Naseem. So that's eight in total. Yep. And those other six guys are Khurram Shahzad, Muhammad Ali, Hassan Ali, Wasim Jr., Haris Rauf, and Mir Hamza. Now, Naseem is the best of the lot. Uh, if you take a, a look at the wickets that have been taken, uh, that's not particularly surprising. He is, we all know he's really good. And he struck 18 times in five test matches at less than 33 apiece. Khurram Shahzad actually has the best average, which is 24.44. But he's played just two test matches. And he took nine wickets across them. And he is always injured as well. He has that issue. The next best, Jared, is Muhammad Ali, who is averaging 67.66 with the ball. And that really tells you a story, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, you know, as I said, I I don't know why you bothered reading them out. It doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. People need to understand the gravity of the situation and the gulf between those numbers, really. I yeah, feel. but my point is, like, it's just like those are just not people who are going to factor in anymore. Like, it, they're all mm. that's it's almost th- that generation's almost already gone. Whatever we call that generation, <laughs> that yeah. should never should you know didn't work generation, right? Like, yeah, and I and so it's it it just shows you that they're looking for something that doesn't exist. Yeah, and and like to sum it all up, you know, the fact that none of these seamers, barring Naseem Shah, have featured in even five test matches amongst these, or, you know, uh, including these, or not including, but within these 10 winless test matches at home. Uh, And also, Hassan Ali was the only cricketer or bowler in these seamers who had played test cricket uh, before, apart from Shaheen and Naseem. So you're looking at negligible experience on offer, and then you have no... continuity and selection. You're kind of picking and choosing and waiting for the next best thing. And then you also have poor injury management. Let's not forget that. That's always big in Pakistan cricket. That's something the PCB excels at, poor injury management. And one thing that I really want to talk to you about is the sheer lack of pace. Pakistan is known for express pace bowling. Usman Samyuddin coined the term pace is pace. Yeah, they made a podcast out of it for crying out loud, right? Mm. And the only express pacer that we've seen in these 10 winless test matches at home is Haris Rauf, who broke down after bowling 13 overs versus England, right? It's the combination combination of all of these issues, which is why basically Pakistan's bowling sucks big time at home now. Agreed. Yeah. 
Which one do you think is the biggest factor, really? You've got negligible experience, no continuity, poor injury management, and then sheer lack of pace. I think not having their two best bowlers available to them and fully fit is obviously a big deal. Mm. Um, so I, I would find it hard not to say that's not the biggest one. But when it comes down to it, it goes back to what you said before. It's the idea that we can just find another Nazim Shah and another Shaheen Afridi and, mm. and whatever. I think that's where the issues really come from. Yeah, and now Mohammed Asnan, you know, just worked on his bowling in England with Shabazz Chaudhary at Speed Camp, had a good domestic tournament, the Champions One Day Cup. And knowing Pakistan cricket, if these guys, like the current seamers aren't working, they're just going to throw him into a test match, whereas he hasn't even played first-class cricket. So that's basically what defines the PCB. They mix formats, they don't really think properly, and... They don't even give people a proper run, right? That is that is a big one. But we've spoken a lot about the seamers. We have to talk about the spinners, right? Now, Abrar Ahmed, uh, who is Pakistan's frontline spinner currently in this team, had a phenomenal start to his test career versus England, also in Multan, picked up 11 wickets on test match debut. Mm. And he also has 29 wickets uh, in five home tests at a bowling average north of 36. He has dropped off in recent times, obviously, after that insane start. Part of the reason might be that people might have worked him out. Also, he's been injured a lot. and then Also, Pakistan people have... are no longer trying to hit him for six every ball? Yeah, that too. And you know, Pakistan have literally not even warmed him up properly in the sense that, sure, he's been injured, but he's been, you know, uh, warming the bench for the longest time. He hasn't played any first-class cricket, so he's not primed right now to just go out there and perform in a test match. Um, and what's fascinating over here is that if you look at Pakistan's return to, uh, you know, home soil after UAE, you've got the likes of Yasser Shah, who literally just fell off a cliff once Pakistan returned home. There have been other spinners, Jared, Zahid Mahmood, Sajid Khan, Numan Ali, you know, Abrad himself. None of these guys have averaged under 36 with ball in hand, right? Uh, since Pakistan returned from the UAE. And this might not be their biggest issue, you know, as far as pain points are concerned, but it's a pain point nonetheless. And that is because in this period, there have been five overseas spinners who have fared better than Pakistan's tweakers. So it is an issue. Yes. Um, yes, Ishaab was the last time they really had an international spinner that was a frontline, I suppose. Um, and then Shadab Khan should be a frontline spinner and has got injured. Yeah. And everyone else looks ordinary. I mean, mm. I, that, I mean that's the truth. You, I can't remember the last time I saw a Pakistani spinner and went, oh, okay, there's something here. You just look yeah. at them and you go, okay. They're okay, you know, yeah. and that's, Forget, that's about all it is. Forget second spinner, right? They don't even have a primary spinner. And again, Zafar Gohar could have been that guy, but you wasted him. Uh, he plays for Gloucester now. And someone recently told me that he's leaving Gloucester, but I'm sure he's got another county gig because he's done well in England. And he played a solitary test match in Christchurch, right? Out of all places. The place mm. where it won't turn at all. And then you just discarded him. And now because he's getting a steady paycheck, which is also not a thing in Pakistan, the current men's and women's teams, are they haven't been paid for four months. And this is a common theme. We keep seeing this over and over again. But in again, Pakistan, right? you only have to pay your mortgage every once every four months, don't you? That's how mortgages <laughs> work. Yeah, well, in Pakistan, you know, you're either paying rent or you own a house and mortgages are just not for everyone, I suppose, because no one really has... Uh, well, let's just say that the amount of money people earn is just not enough for them to sustain their lives. That's where the country is. It's in economic turmoil. And the PCB, despite overpaying all of those mentors, <laughs> cannot pay their actual cricketers. And, and you know what? I don't know if... like This is obviously not linked to the bowling issue, but it definitely is linked to Pakistan's decline. It's the management of the team. They aren't looked after. No. It, do, do, I, I did a podcast with... I forget the name of it, but I was on a Pakistani podcast the other day. Um, hmm. and, and he was sort of asking, you know, what the problem is. And I was like... Every all the major cricket nations are professional, yeah. And Pakistan is not, and yeah. so talent gets you a fair way. And West Indies showed this, right, not that long ago. But even the West Indies, they professionalized a little bit by playing in all those leagues around the world, yeah. right? Pakistan cricket is not professional in any way, shape, or form, mm -hmm. and it's very hard to go up against other players when you're when you've got that lack of professionalism. And you know, we're talking about the men's team over here. Forget women's. You know, that's that's another story altogether. But it's just really sad to see how such a proud cricketing nation with such rich heritage and someone or, or a, a nation which has earned a lot of respect in cricket has not been able to kind of formalize a proper system 
There is no structure. And that is what ultimately hurts Pakistan cricket. But coming back to the bowling, you know, it wasn't long ago, Jared, that Yasser Shah broke Clary Grimmett's record of quickest to 200 wickets. He got there in 33 games. Grimmett mm -hmm. got there in 36. He's washed now. He used to kind of bend his back a lot. A lot of his power and bowling prowess came from his back. And he bowled so much that his body broke down. You look at Mohammad Abbas, who you mentioned earlier. He had, what, 90 test wickets at 23 apiece when Pakistan just discarded him. And as you mentioned, he's got 192 wickets uh, for Hampshire in that period ever since uh, Pakistan discarded him. And he's, what, uh, got them at less That's than 22 apiece. That's yeah, also yeah. domestic cricket in Pakistan. He was he hmm. kept starring everywhere he's bowled. I, yeah, I mean, don't, don't even get me started on this whole. Uh, the The problem with Muhammad Abbas is that he wasn't as sexy as Muhammad Asif, and he's not fast. Yeah. That's yep. the only issue that I could. Have. People are like, oh, look, he had four or five tests where he didn't take a wicket, and it's like, so what? You've got about twenty other blokes who haven't yeah. taken any wickets. I mean, Hassan Ali, if you look at his last seven test matches, he took eight wickets, right? His drop-off was catastrophic as well. Uh, you spoke of uh, Shadab Khan. He started off so well, and then his groin kind of hampered his progress, and he's more of a batting all-rounder at this point. Uh, the he's guy, almost a specialist batter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think you're being friendly, even still calling him. Like, he's almost a specialist mm. batter, part-time bowler. Like, he's fighting it as much as he can, but that's it, it looks like that he's going to end up as George Dockrell. <laughs> and, and I George, mean, George Dockrell of Pakistan is everyone calls shut up. Do you know Muhammad Abbas, uh, his suite in uh, Southampton? Uh, Pep Guardiola was visiting the Man City manager and they didn't vacate Abbas's suite for him. They were like, this is Mo Abbas's suite. And if you've no, got. No. Uh, I think Muhammad Abbas refused to vacate for Pep Guardiola, <laughs> I think is the full story, which, full respect, he's like, no, no, this is my ground. He's just visiting. And yeah, it is his ground. Like, look, I think he averages 19 for Hampshire in that period. Yeah, I mean, look, if he's averaging, what, 19-odd for Hampshire and he's taken 192 wickets at less than 22 apiece since he last featured for Pakistan, he's he's clearly doing something right and it's falling on deaf ears uh, somehow uh, amongst Pakistan selectors. You also mentioned how Naseem Shah is so... He's injured so often. Shaheen has also, you know, suffered a lot from injury and he's just a shadow of his former self at this point. Those two guys are barely available at the same point. Uh, Shaheen, Naseem and Abrar have never played a home test match together, right? Yeah. There's also that fact, right? Pakistan's supreme bowling legacy is basically a thing of the past now, Jared, and that's what's so heartbreaking in all of this. And it, it's kind of uber recent, if you think about it too, because it hmm. wasn't that long ago that they had access to um, like a T20 team that was bowling dominated right and, yes. and a one day team that was bowling dominated and if as you, you go before, back to if way, you go no. back to yeah if, if you go back to the 2022 t20 world cup everyone every single pundit was saying that pakistan is the best bowling team in this tournament yeah. so yeah. you know so uh, that's kind of why i don't think it's i don't want to say the end of the world but hmm. it's pretty bad but that's kind of why i don't think it's like the uh, the end right yeah. like it, things shouldn't stop that quickly but this is where Adults need to be involved, right? Mm -hmm. And to be fair to the chairman, and like, he's welcome on the podcast anytime <laughs> um, he wants to come on. At, at a certain point, Pakistan cricket does not need Muhammad Afiz or Wahab Riaz or, you know, uh, these rash appointments, even Gillespie and Kirsten, right? Mm. It needs a structure and it needs yeah. to decide what kind of cricket it wants to play across all the formats. And it needs adults with professional backgrounds to come in and make sure that the entire structure is better. And if you don't do that, you end up in positions like this again, where some of these people have been picked on, you know, by whim on whims, right? Like just yeah. random whims of like, Oh, we don't know what to do. Let's pick this person. That cannot be how you pick your teams anymore. And it's an unacceptable way of doing things. And, um, the problem with Pakistan cricket isn't that, you know, Shaheen doesn't want it enough or that, a bra isn't good enough or any, th those aren't the problems with Pakistan cricket. The problems with Pakistan cricket is they are amateurs playing in a world of professionalism and it's coming undone over and over again. And yes, sometimes talent will still rise them to the top. It wasn't that long ago. We, I said the same thing about Australia. I thought up until very recently, Australia was very similar with this, where it was like India and, pa India and um, uh, England were really, really professional. And Australia was like, ah, oh, we'll work it out. 
Well, hmm. When we get to the World, World Cup, we'll work it out. And they even won a World Cup doing that. Since then, they've got so professional with the way that they think about their planning and their, you know, uh, how they play within games and all these sorts of, you know, other ways of going about it. And if Australia is willing to do that, Pakistan has to do a similar because Australia and Pakistan will continually find talented players. But yeah. if you go up against a team of 35 um, analysts and if you're going up against, think about English cricket right now. You talk to county players. In fact, there's a really inter interesting interview with, on Willow Talk with Nathan Lyon where he was talking about the fact that there's this really interesting juxtaposition where there are all these county players who are being told to attack more and more. They're like, mm. well, it's bloody hard doing county cricket because the wickets are nothing like that you guys get in test cricket. But all of those county crickets, cricketers know if you want to play for England, you need to play our style of cricket. Right at the moment, what is Pakistan's style of cricket? Not a single person would be able to answer that, right? Not the yeah. captain, the many coaches, <laughs> not the chairman. Not a, is there a CEO? I don't, is there a CEO? I don't even think there is a CEO. No. No. Is the chairman the CEO? Which is always a sign of shit, right? Yeah, you and can't even have a person, because the chairman and the CEO are completely different jobs. There are right. also a lot of crony appointments, right? People who are just buds with the chairman and, you know, there's that former analyst who was a f politician in, like, a, the Ministry of Forestry and Fisheries and something like that. So I'm hearing the new media manager is a buddy of that dude, right? So it's a lot of that. And also, you know, one thing that we actually didn't have in the piece and it's just come to my mind is also workload management and they do it poorly. They will yeah. not play these bowlers in test matches and they'll rest them in tests and they'll probably have broken them down by the time test cricket comes around. And they're playing like Haris Rao, Shahin Shafridi and Naseem Shah are all starting versus Nepal at home. That's the sort of stuff that Pakistan does, which doesn't set themselves or, or you know, this team up to do well in test cricket because you're not prioritizing it. Shaheen just, just recently missed a test match in Australia because he wanted to play all the T20s. Stuff like that. Yeah, you just saw Australia play in England with what... Bartlett, Hardy, I'm trying to think of who else they had. Sean, like, Sean know, Abbott. Sean Abbott. Sean Abbott. Yeah, Sean Abbott's a good one. Um, they went into one game with a bowler short, really. Yeah. And I think it was a bit of an experiment, but I also think they were like, we've got a couple of injuries they, here. They also went into one game with the bowler short, Matt Short. <laughs> well, there you go. The fact that they had to bowl him. <laughs> yeah. Um, and um, yeah, so so you look at all that and you're just like, that's what the other teams are doing, right? Mm. Look at India. They play lots of series with just random yep. people they're trying to learn about, right? Mm. You know, there's 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 nothing they can do. Um, yeah. uh, uh, you know, and so that's the situation um, that, that it is. So, Yeah, I mean, you look at these fringe bowlers for Pakistan and they don't get to play those T20s, which no one cares about. The first string guys are always playing them. But they're, they're broken by the time a test match comes around and then you see the fringe bowlers and they're like, why are these guys not performing? And, you know, there's just so much to it. And we've obviously discussed a lot of different factors behind Pakistan's slump uh, as far as bowling is concerned. And we've gone through all the eras. So tell us what your thoughts are. Which, which factors are the most key in the comments section below? And I agree with Jared. I don't think this is a forever demise. Pakistan will be back. But they might just find another diamond in the rough and... That bowler might give them a few years, but until there's a system, they can't really become a consistent bowling side yeah, anymore, I, I think feel. that's and, and, the thing, isn't it? It's, yeah, it's, that, it? How do you get consistent when you're doing this sort of stuff? Absolutely. So yeah, uh, we hope that you enjoyed our autopsy and our walk down memory lane as well. And thank you for sticking around for 61 or 62 minutes. But that pretty much sums up or ends this podcast. Just a quick reminder to everybody, you can go to goodareas.co and bookmark that webpage. And that can prove to be your one-stop shop for all the work that we do as part of this team, whether it be written pieces, podcasts, or videos. And of course, this particular project, it'll all be out together. You'll see the article, the footmarks, and the actual video that Jared has narrated. You know, you'll see it all at one point. And, you know, it was a lot of fun working on it with Varun and Jared and everyone. So hopefully we'll, we'll get you even more quality content in the future. We're always working around the clock and we'll have even more live shows as well. A podcast every day. That's the future we see at Good Areas. So enjoy yourselves, guys. Have a good couple of days or whatever till we see you again. And that'll be us, uh, it for, from us today. Goodbye. <laughs>